Okay, I'm, oh, I'm out of here. Good evening, everybody. My name is Francis Clark. This is a recording of a program done by Teton Plants a week ago. And because it wasn't recorded at that time, we are re recording it at this time. The program was sponsored by Teton Plants and the Teton County Library, which sponsors the Nature Nights at the Teton County Library at six o'clock every Tuesday evening. We share this space with the geology, the geologists of Jackson Hole and the Bird and Nature Club of Jackson Hole. So anytime you hear of us, just um, link in to the library and you can find out what's going on Tuesday nights, Nature Nights at six o'clock. Again, my name is Francis Clark. I am the program coordinator for Teton Plants. Teton Plants is a chapter of the Wyoming Native Plant Society. We're an all volunteer organization. And we're basically here to get people excited and interested about our native plants around us. So I'm gonna launch right into our program this evening, which is the nature and identification of plants in winter. And here we go. So what are we gonna be talking about this evening? We're gonna be talking about the challenges that plants have when winter comes to the very cold of Jackson Hole here in Wyoming. We're gonna talk about how do they survive? What's their value to wildlife? And how do we identify them? There are some plants that are sticking up out of the snow, not a lot of them, but they are also the obvious plants out there. They include the conifers, a few deciduous trees, and several different shrubs. So we'll be covering about 25 different species with a little quiz at the end. So to start off, let's review our basic science about plants and how they grow and how they keep themselves alive. The first thing to, to think about is this combination of carbon dioxide, which is what we breathe out into the air all the time, water, which is there and around, we'll talk about how it gets there, the process is a magical process of photosynthesis, which then turns the carbon dioxide and water into sugar and also into oxygen, which is what we then breathe in. So plants are very important to many of us. So how do they get the water? The water and some extra minerals, like your fertilizer minerals, go up through the roots, up through vessels, through the stem. They go out to the tippy tip of the branches to the leaves. And the leaves have little chloroplasts inside of them. This is the real machinery of photosynthesis. And also in the leaves comes in the carbon dioxide. There's little holes in the bottom of the leaves. They come in, they join the water and the minerals inside the chloroplast. And then with the energy from the sun, hitting those leaves, then so this magic process goes on and you get the development of sugars that are retained by the leaves and then the oxygen that goes back out through the holes in the leaves. One thing to remember is that a lot of the water that comes in from the, the roots goes up all the way through the plant, through those vessels, about 90% of that water or more goes right on out through the plant. So you can imagine it needs a lot of water and all these cells also need water in order to survive. So that's the basics. And so I want to just make sure those were clear and that we can remember them from our early days of biology. So what are the challenges of winter? Well, it gets dark, gets cold, and here we get a lot of snow. So dark, short days and low light, well, that's gonna limit the photosynthetic process because it's the light that is powering all of this conversion to sugars. The other thing is, even if you have evergreen leaves, they're still sitting out there, there's less operational time. The days are shorter, the light's less, so they just can't operate as long and as well. And then the critical thing is they can't make enough food in order to keep the systems going because it takes a lot of energy just to keep a, keep going the, the living cells that are there, not to mention growing. Cold, that's the other big thing. As most of us understand, a lot of metabolic functions slow down 
And then if the cells and the tissues actually freeze, then they just don't work, they all seize up. And if the ground freezes, then again, that water that was so important to the whole process can't come up through the roots. And then the cells also can begin to desiccate, to dry out because they don't have any fresh water supply. The other thing that happens if you're a broadleaf tree, like your aspens and cottonwoods, those broad leaves will catch the snow. And that's a weighty, there's a weighty weight there. And the snow can break the plant apart, which obviously isn't very good for the plant. But the benefits of snow is that they can insulate the roots and they can insulate the plants that are weighed down underneath there, under the snow. So good and bad snow for challenges to plants in winter. So how do they survive? Well, again, I mentioned that they have to store up enough food to, to keep themselves going throughout the winter. They shed those big useless leaves, all those big, big deciduous leaves that load the snow. They close down the rest of the system to the bare minimum. They actually drain the cells of water and add antifreeze. There's a bit more cellular magic that goes in there, which I'll try to explain to you the best I can. And then the plant has to be ready to grow fast come spring. It doesn't want to lose any time with our short summers here. So they have to, everything's got to be all set to go as well. Shoot. So if you think about it, summer is the most productive time for the plants. It puts out those brand new leaves, those food factories. It starts pumping food. It starts pumping extra minerals and whatnot that they make in the leaves throughout the rest of the plant. So it's just going wild. So summer is the most productive time. There's a lot of leaves for photosynthesis. There's a lot of warmth and sun to power the cells. And there's always, usually, unless we're in a drought, there's plenty of water and then the nutrients are available because a lot of the soil organisms are turning those old dead leaves and debris into new nutrients, fresh nutrients that are available. And then with all that energy and those materials, they can make new tissues, they can make fruits, they can make seeds, they can help defend themselves. In other words, they're growing and they're reproducing all throughout the summer. But then summer ends. Again, the light gets less and it becomes different. The days get cooler and the nights get even cooler. The systems just aren't as productive. And the plant has to adjust itself. It does this gradually over time so that it can actually go dormant and be, be totally inactive in essence over the winter time. And it's the hormones that actually signal these changes. Little sort of chemical phytochromes in the cells that are telling the plant what to do. Pretty amazing. So annuals, we aren't talk much about them because annuals are plants that um, sprout up in the spring. They make their seeds and then the basic plant dies and the only thing that left to keep it going for another generation are, are the seeds. So we're not gonna talk about them, but we will talk about the perennial plants like our woody plants, trees and shrubs. So the leaves are out there in the summer and the shifting in the light starts triggering those hormones I was talking about. And with those triggers, the plants start storing extra food into the roots and underground stems. If you think of your irises, if you think of uh, your bulb plants, if your vegetable garden, your potatoes, your beets, they're all storing food down into the underground of the plants. Sometimes those are technically roots, sometimes they're stems, but most of it's comprised of starch, which is a really pretty good sense of energy there. Here's another little corn. Woody plants have a much bigger body and a much tougher body. So it stores its food into the twigs, the trunks, some ray cells I'll talk about in a minute. And they also store starches down in the roots as well. So there's stored food all over the body of the woody plant. The other thing that happens, which is pretty cool, is as the leaves begin to um, die off, a lot of the materials that were in the leaves move back into the body of the plant. They're recycling a lot of those valuable minerals that they picked up to grow with in the first place and they're putting them back into the body of the plant. So all is not lost, they're ready to be recycled. 
And then the plants are substashing these minerals and nutrients and starches and sugars and a little bit of extra water into certain cells in the plant. And so like a pantry all set for the winter. And while the plant is storing up extra food, they're also forming buds. Again, this is triggered by the decreasing day length. And so what the plant is doing is making new little baby, little sort of uh, incipient buds. Let me show you what that looks like. So this is the stem of the plant. This is the leaf going out the petiole. And right in that nexus there, in that axis, as they call it, there's little stem cells that are beginning to form into a bud. And then around the outside of the bud, you're getting um, scales to help protect it through the winter. So little incipient shoots and flowers coming up in there, but they're gonna sit there now for the winter time. There's hormones are saying, nope, don't grow yet. But those are gonna be the shoots for the next year. And I want you to notice this little spot here because what's happening in the fall time when you saw that different coloration of the leaves, what's happening is a lot of those nutrients, as I said, are going back down through the vessel system, back into the body of the plant. And this part right here is beginning to seal off with cork. And so what is sealing off any water going back out and therefore dehydrating the plant. And since they've pretty much relocated everything it needs, back into the body of the plant from the leaf, it's all set to be sealed up for the winter. Notice the bud is always sitting here. So the leaves fall off from the stem. At that point, there again. And when the leaf falls off, this is the scar that it leaves. It's called a leaf scar, as made from the base of the petiole. And these little tiny dots here bundle traces are where the vessels went out. And now they're clogged up with cork. So again, gradually the plants are going dormant. They're dropping their leaves, they form their buds, they've stored up some food, and the plant is just going into in a state of inactivity when there's, the cells are no longer dividing, but some of them are still alive. Again, this process takes several weeks if you put a deep freeze on the plant in August, everything is gonna freeze up solid and die. But if you do it by mid-September, those the plant parts are gonna be fine. So again, there's still a few living cells going on, although a lot of parts have fallen off and died. And there's actually, there's quite a bit of living tissue in the plant in the winter time. They've discovered there's about 8% in conifers and about 24% in deciduous trees. Where are these living cells? Just briefly, is these green parts down on what they often will call the cambium tissue, the um, stem cells that can divide later in the um, roots, in the tips of the roots, just under the bark as you go up, under, in the buds, lots of buds, so all the green are actually still living cells in the plant. And then there's another set of cells which uh, the scientists didn't pay a heck of a lot of attention to for a long time, but these are alive too. These are what they call the ray cells. And these are really important storage cells for the plants. It's sort of like the extra attic um, where the, a lot of the food and the water will go up and down the vessel system, but then it gets stored into the sides here, sort of like the extra spaces in your attic. And so those are also living cells and are very important to the storage of energy for the plant in the future, both energy and nutrients and minerals to be ready for the spring. Okay, this is a plant cell. And this is the thing, this is the part of the plant that in winter is the most vulnerable. And so the idea is that the plant needs to keep this from freezing and also from dehydrating. Plant cells are a little bit complicated. They do have this wall, cell wall we've always heard about. There's a little membrane that's tucked inside of that. And then there's all these other pieces that are inside the cell, which I'm not gonna go into, but just think about there's a lot of 
of solution in there, lots of watery elements to a cell. And this is the part that if it's not balanced correctly, the cell can die or get out of chemical balance, molecular balance. So what happens inside these cell walls, a lot begins to happen in the fall time. One of the things that happens is that the, a lot of the water goes out of the cells and goes into the, between the cells here. The starches inside the cells become more sugary and that helps it become um, sort of more of an antifreeze kind of material as well as more fatty acids. So there's antifreezes that are building up in the cells. The cells are becoming, the insides of the cells are becoming more concentrated, a higher degree of solutes, which some of us may remember, it keeps things from freezing as easily. And then the other sort of interesting thing is that the membrane itself, just inside that cell wall, becomes more permeable to allow all of this exchange and going on. And so here's just another picture. Again, it's a complicated thing that's going on here. This is a thing, that needs to stay alive through the winter time in certain places of the plant that we talked about. And this membrane is one of the critical pieces of making sure everything is going well, as well as a wall that just gives everything some extra protection. And so the membrane, as I talked about, is a very complicated structure. It looks simple like a simple line, but it's not. Um, it's got things like carbohydrates mixed in there. It's got lipids or so different kinds of fat layers mixed in, proteins. We know proteins can be very, very sensitive to um, their actions um, because all those actions are dependent upon enzymes. And so this is a very complicated structure which can be highly affected by, by cold or too much heat. So one of the things that plants do, and some animals can do this as well, is that they can super cool. The cells can be go down really, really cold, much colder than anybody would think that they would be able to stay alive and not freeze. So super cooling is technically the cooling of the liquid be below the freezing temper temperature that's expected, given how much is concentrated in that cell. Okay, so this is really important that it can go really, really cold without breaking apart. And some of the stages of this includes the ice, um, excuse me, the water in between the cells that have been placed out there. When it freezes, it freezes between the cells, not in the cells, not within the membranes. They're sharp, ice is sharp, it's pokey, but it when it pushes out, the membrane is now softened and so it doesn't break. It may break through the cell wall, but it won't break through the, that very sensitive membrane. Okay, and again, there's an increased set of solutes inside the cell. All of this still streams around very, very slowly, slow enough to prevent little, little ice crystals beginning to form. Once an ice crystal begins to form, then it goes like wildfire and everything else crystallizes as well. This little starter part is called an ice nuclei, nucleation. But again, um, the way the changes that are going on, the cellular magic going on, it prevents us the beginning of ice to form. It adds special proteins. And even when, if there is ice forming, it keeps the ice rounded, which is pretty amazing, less sharp and less likely to really go to town in its uh, crystallization. So a lot of sort of, again, cellular magic going on, which the scientists are still trying to determine because this is the critical piece to keeping the plant cells alive in winter. And again, super cooling. Um, many plants that we are, have adapted, evolved in the north temperate zones can go down to minus 40 degrees centigrade, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit as well, same point on the um, thermometer there. And that's pretty amazing. That's darn cold if you think about it, okay? The water isn't freezing at that point. Although many plants that are good at super cooling, this is the critical point where it does begin to sit, freeze inside the cell as opposed to just outside the cell. So again, minus 40 is of a critical point um, where ice usually forms in the cell. But again, uh, several of our Northern plants don't do that yet. Some cottonwoods go down to minus 50 degrees centigrade and the 
the red stem dogwood, which we have planted all over here, can go down to minus 196 degrees centigrade. Amazing, without becoming dehydrated and having the whole cell structure um, disintegrate. So this is how plants are staying alive. And again, it's a process. It's the plants can, as over time, as they adapt over the months from August into September in our territory here, the plants can adapt to even below freezing. And then there's a point where the it freezes, the water that's between the cells, been placed between the cells freezes. And then the ice in the xylem, which is the water conducting cells, which is actually, those aren't living cells anymore, but that water will freeze inside those cells. And then the plant keeps on living. Those cells keep on living until you get down to a so critical minus 40 degrees. Um, many of the cell contents will freeze, many of the plants will then die, but some survive even lower. The other thing is that once the plant has adapted to the winter, it needs to stay dormant for the duration. If it gets a couple of really warm days in January, January thaw, you don't want, the plant just doesn't want to come out of that deep dormancy that it's been in. And so there's hormones that are making sure that everything stays dormant for the duration. And then come early spring, the light's changing, uh, the buds, it's the sunlight is hitting these bud scales that are then um, sensing that change, the hormones begin to operate and the plant begins to grow. Those buds out of the buds shoots new leaves and everything begins to grow again. Everything is back in full operation. And partly because there's been food that's been stashed away so it can put it out into those new leaves while everything gets going. Okay, we've been doing micro, uh, let's go macro. What do the plants offer wildlife? Well, shelter is a big one. If you think about all those nice evergreen leaves and stands of conifers, and you can have your um, deer and your moose and all of that sort of grow in a, away from the wind. Um, there's a lot of what they call structure in that sense of fallen leaves, and, excuse me, fallen uh, trunks and limbs that other animals can move through. There are holes, big and small, that creators, big and small, can huddle in like chickadees or squirrels. There may be a few fruits. There's not a lot of fruits left at this time of the year. A lot in the fall, but they're getting plucked off by the migrating birds and the other birds that are sticking around. A lot of them don't seem to have a lot of nutrition left. They're pretty frizzled up or disenchanted. So um, the animals are really reduced to eating a lot of uh, twigs and stems and bark. Essentially, they're eating wood. You can imagine it's not very nutritious. So they're really doing their best. If you see these hairs here, they are getting down to the cambium, which is some of those um, cells along the stem that have a little bit more nutrition because they are alive. And so your moose and your deer are the browsers. And again, they're going after the, the few stems above ground. And they're working off their, their fat reserves that they did in the, in the fall time. There may be a few seeds scattered out there, scattering fast. There could be some grasses with some grains on them. Those seeds are great for the little birds. They have the little beaks. They're perfect for picking them up. Picking our juncos or rosy finches, horn larks, snow buntings. You'll often see them seeding on the ground or on the snow going after those little seeds. Sedges, this is one of my favorite groups of plants. They're often overlooked. They look a lot like grasses, but they're actually really critically important. They're usually growing in the wetlands. And I tell you, the bison count on them in the winter time. So I add them in here. The other thing that we talked about in the beginning are that the perennial herbaceous plants like your perennial flowers in your gardens store up all this extra starch down underground. And this is great food for critters such as pocket gophers that do not hibernate. They're just burrowing in under the ground after these foods. 
So let's talk a little bit about con conifer trees and why they are particularly adapted to winter, because they are. If you are living here in Jackson Hole and you look to the mountains, you're going to be seeing the conifers up there. You're going to be seeing maybe a few aspens in the lower echelons, but not higher in the higher areas. If you go north into Canada in the cold places, again, you're going to see primarily conifer trees because they are evolved for winter. One thing they have is they've got the conical shape, which helps to shed the snow. If you look at these branches, no branch is getting all the snow at once. It sheds off. These are fairly short and flexible branches. Um, you can't see, but in some of them, they have quite rough bark that also keeps them from splitting. And we'll talk a little bit about these narrow vessels, the tracheids, that reduce the freezing of the pipe system. We'll talk about that. So these are the conifer vessels. These are very early types of vessels in plants. Conifers have them. Your deciduous trees like your maples and your cottonwood have a combination of tracheids, but they have a lot more what they call truly vessel elements. And these are designed very differently. And these tracheids are particularly adapted to the cold and are dry. Why are they? Well, for one, they're very narrow and they're also very strong. And they have, because it's such a small space, it's harder for the water to expand when it wants to freeze. So it, it needs, uh, the water needs a much colder temperature to actually freeze in these small spaces. I've learned that air bubbles form when ice forms. And air bubbles are frozen in that ice in the winter time, but then they're released when the water starts running again, when the sap starts running again in the springtime. And that can be a problem because those air bubbles can um, embolize, can break up the very important water column that is essential for water to get from the roots up to the leaves in springtime. But these kinds of cells have a particular type of membrane too. This is very technical, but you see these little pits here. That's what this looks like. And number one, those are very small, so the air bubbles can't get through. And also this also serves as a screening. So these special tracheids, these um, water cells that carry the water up, they, um, they don't get the big bubbles in them. So the tension in the water column isn't broken. So the Basically, the piping system still works, which is really important for the plant. Water keeps going up. The other thing they have are the little evergreen needles. These are small, they're very waxy, they're bunched. This all keeps them from drying out because again, those are living cells inside. They often have resins or tannins that keep them from drying out as well or being eaten. These needles are called evergreens because the needles last several years. Okay, they'll, they'll drop off in the spruce and fir after two or three years, but the new ones come up and the old ones stay on and eventually the really old ones fall off. And then they can photosynthesize, make that energy in the starches during the spring time, the fall time till it gets really cold and everything shuts down. And again, in the springtime, when things warm up enough that they can start some photosynthesis. Okay, so these needles are less efficient overall than your deciduous tree leaves, but they keep them for longer. And so there's less waste going on. And they're just much more durable for living in through the very long winters that we have. And they've got the plants all set and ready to grow in the spring by being right there. Wildlife. Wildlife in these conifer forests um, are, is abundant. We have all sorts of little birds that hang out in the wintertime. And again, they're taking advantage of the being protected from the winds, having lots of nooks and crannies to glean off insects and eggshells and things that are all inside their little insect eggshells. Uh, lots of gleaning areas, lots of cover, lots of holes. They particularly like the cones, um, the conifer cones, which have all the seeds. The seeds are sitting in underneath each of these scales. Red squirrel particularly um, requires the spruce trees and the pine trees. And what they do is they form middens, big 
areas where they hide or stash the cones throughout the winter. It's sort of like putting a cigar in a humidor. They stash them in there. There's just enough humidity and protection that it keeps the, the seeds fresh so that they can eat them and pull them out each throughout the winter time and keep themselves fed. And that's why they defend the territory so much. You know how loud red squirrels are. Well, that's because they don't, can't let anybody get their stash or they'll die. Well, they're vulnerable when they're running around the trees in the wintertime, and they're particularly vulnerable to pine martens. And pine martens are, are boreal weasel creatures, and they're running around and they're trying to get the red squirrels. Dusky grouse may be hanging out there and they're eating the buds of the conifers. So a lot of things are going on in living off of those conifers in wintertime. So let's identify some of these trees. The nice thing about identifying conifers in winter is it's basically the same features that you're going to see in the summertime. So all that we're going to be talking about is going to really help you out year round. So one of the first ones and often the more uh, prominent ones, especially as you get higher and higher elevations, are the subalpine firs. And oftentimes they have these really thin spirally um, habit to them, shape to them. Not always, but often they do subalpine firs. And they're known because their, their cones sit at the top here, but they fall apart. So you're unlikely to find a cone at the base of the tree is a good clue. Again, the cones sit up, they stand up. There they are in late summer, ready to be collected or um, birds will come in and as the seeds ripen, but then all of these scales will spin off, releasing the, the, the seeds that go off onto the wind. That's the way the firs have their cones are at top and they fall apart. We often think of firs as being friendly. That's because if you shake hands with it, take a branch in it, it's, it's really quite soft. They often have a, they also have a soft gray bark. They have single needles. We'll see a few others have single needles as well. But the base of them is sort of like a piece of putty just sitting into making a small indentation into the branchlet there. And then the leaves themselves are flat and blunt. So when again, when you shake it, it feels soft. Engelmann spruce is another matter. Again, it can be this spiral, this sort of tall, um, thin shape to it to shed the snow in the winter time. But spruces can have this sort of rough, scaly bark. And then they also have the single needles, but they're really sharp. You could try to shake hands with the Engelmann spruce and you just you back off. So sharp needles single, they're squarish, they're strong, they are, tend to be stiff, pointing out all around from the plant, and they stand on pegs. This is a good giveaway. They stand out on pegs. Here it is again. Their cones are also different. They stay on the tree or they fold, fall off intact. You often see them on the ground. Again, these are, can be collected by your red squirrels and other critters. And here's some comparisons, just so you can get your eye going on these differences. And again, these differences last throughout the year. The soft fir, the peggy spruce. So those are two to compare. A third one comes on the scene, often mixed in, are Douglas firs. They tend to be a little bit broader in their shape. The needles and the little branchlets tend to dangle down more. It has a rough bark, but it's not a scaly bark. It's not sort of falling apart on the outside. Bark helps a lot in winter time, by the way. And then um, they have, again, single needles. They're on a little stalk, but it's nothing like the peg that you get in the spruce. And they're a bit longer. They're sort of blunt and they're flat. One thing that I find helpful is that they have pointed buds. And then if you find these, you're, you know what you have. Um, they have the scales, but then they have bracts between the scales. When you teach this to children, we often say there's a, there are mice that have 
gone scurrying and hiding themselves under the scales of the cone in order to protect themselves from the great horned owl that might be lurking around in that nice big dense evergreen tree. So the mouse-like bracts are very helpful too if you find a cone. <clears throat> and again, this is a more of a profile of the way the needles can look. Again, those little fine stalks to them. And there was a program just the other day by Taza Shamming who's been doing a tremendous amount of work on Clark's nutcrackers, which are specialty birds. Um, they, they are very important for the planting of white bark pine and white bark pine feeds them. But it also turns out that Douglas fir is one of the key components, most consistent component to their habitats. <coughs> so here you can take a look again and compare the spruce to the fir. And then you can compare the needles of the three. And hopefully you can tell which is which. Here are your labels, fir, spruce, dug fir. So those are the single needled conifers that are typical to our area. And then we have a couple of pines I'm gonna go over. Pines have longer needles. They are in bunches. In the lodgepole pine, which is our most common pine, they are in twos, in pairs. They sort of fluff out um, around the stem, it makes it sort of look like a, um, a big bottle brush effect of the needles spit coming off the branches. What's really cool this time of the year, you can also, you know, buds are sort of fascinating. You can see that these, for instance, are going to be the male buds of the large coal, coal pole pine right here. These are going to produce pollen come spring. And then over here in a different part of the plant, you'll see the female buds of cones. Okay. And what will happen is the Pollen, as many of you remember this in the springtime, you get these big clouds of pollen, bad for asthma, comes over, lands on these teeny, teeny little cone-like structures, the females. And then over time, the little cones up here, pollinated little cones. And then by this time, this, was, this is what, you know, what it looked like last year. At this time of year, it looks like this, but this is really only less than a year old and it has a whole nother um nine months to go because it takes 18 months for pine cones to form very different than spruce and and fir trees which will form their cones within a growing season 18 months the other thing that we find with our lodgepole pines is they have these really sharp points to them. That helps to defend them from the red squirrels that really want them. But also they are prized by a lot of crossbills. And the red crossbills are adapted to pry open cones with those crossbills. And they have a tongue to scoop out the seeds inside as they're prying the scales open and then they can store those seeds into a pouch and fly off. So they can work a cone over, gather seeds, and then fly off. And these red cross bills and other, and other birds are what we call eruptive. And so depending on where they are finding the best stashes, that's where you're going to find them in the wintertime. Red cross bills, just one example of a bird that depends on cones in the wintertime. The other pine that we have at the lower elevations here are the limber pines. And this is a fascicle. This is a bunch of needles. And you can see there are five of them here. Okay. Also, the differences you can see is that they have quite flexible stems, gray bark, um, not too rough on the twigs, but rougher when it gets older. Again, bark changes with time as it grows. It's quite interesting that way. When you look at the overall branch, it has sort of a soft grayish look, bluish gray, gray twigs. And then they have quite big cones uh, that are four to six inches and they don't have the spines on them the way you have the logical pole pine. And these are big tough cones that will stay up in the tree or else fall down. You can pick them up and that can be one of your clues to identification. 
These are closely related to your white bark pine, but you're gonna find those at even higher elevations. And you're also gonna find that those cones are really very different. Both your limber pines and your Douglas fir are often found on the high dry hillsides, but they also mix in. They, you know, they're surprising where you'll find them, but dry hillsides as well. This is out the Grovant Road. Also on our buttes, particularly on our south facing sides, you get another evergreen, a conifer, which is the Rocky Mountain juniper. And you can just sort of tell these sort of big um, gumdrops as I sometimes think of them. Um, sitting on those hillsides, often with the bighorn sheep up around them too. These are conifers, but they look very different than the other two sets that we've been seeing. These have um, little tiny, each of these is a little tiny, little scale-like leaf. They have cones, but they look like blueberries. And what you're often going to find in, mixed in with them is a Townsend solitaire because a Townsend solitaire, which is about the size of a robin, really likes those juniper berries. And these juniper berries, by the way, are only found on the female junipers, not on the male junipers. One last evergreen, this is actually our, um, one of our very few broadleaf ever evergreens. And the one that I very, you know, the rare one that I see above the snow at this time of the year, the the trail to Bradley Taggart, um, where we had the old burn, um, is sort of covered with the snow brush, but that may be covered with snow by this time too. And so they, their leaves are evergreen, they're very tough, um, so they can stand up over through the winter time, but they also tend to sort of curl and sort of shrink as they lose their water as well. And again, the snow cover can be really quite important to protect it through the winter time as well. Snow brush. Okay, we've covered the evergreens. We're gonna go on to the deciduous trees and shrubs that again are poking up out of the snow and you're, it's possible for you to see on your hikes and your walks. So deciduous trees and shrubs drop their leaves. Okay, they just, they get rid of them over the winter time, they're useless to them. It's too cold, they're too big, they, they don't help. These are also the plants that have the bigger vessels. They need more water to um, keep those leaves going in the summertime and those bigger vessels, make sure they get those, that enough water to keep themselves functioning. But those are the vessel systems that are on the tree can be a real problem um, with freezing versus the ones for the pine tree. So when you're trying to identify trees and shrubs that are deciduous in the winter time, you need a bunch of clues. And so some of the clues include the buds. Okay, are they opposite? Or are they gonna be alternate? We'll see a combination of each of these. Do you have any fruits left? Do you have some colorful bark or special um, buds again that can give you clues? A few of them have some thorns or some prickles that can help you out. Fragrance can sometimes help too. The other thing is, you know, what's its shape? And then where is it growing? Those are all clues you need to be looking for. And again, just um, these are some of your key clues in the wintertime. What's your bud look like? There are the scale, many scales. Um, how are they arranged? Are they opposite like this? Or are they going to be alternate? One up here, one down there, one up here, one down there alternating down the stem. What size leaf scar do they have? Some of them have a lot of lenticels. These are sort of the um, release valves of the gases from the um, cells metabolizing throughout the year. It's just one way that the um, byproducts can release through the stem of the cell. Oh, excuse me, the stem of the, uh, through the stem, stem bark. So again, a reminder that the scar is from the base of the petiole and the bundle traces, which are arranged differently for each plant, um, is where the vessels were. So let's look at the few species of, in the willow family. Actually, there's a heck of a lot of willows per se in the Salix. Um, there's about 40 different species in Jackson Hole. Um, their stems can be different colors, they can be different sizes, 
But the nice thing about it is they're easy to identify to a willow. And that's because they have one scale. Okay, just one. I could pull this off all in one piece. Okay, and you can see that the moose like it. This is the moose hair. Okay, so one leaf scale for a willow, whatever species it is. And again, willows are really important for um, both moose and beaver in the wintertime. It's their prime food. Aspen is a different, is in a different genus instead of Salix, it's in Populus. And we, uh, most of us are familiar with them. They grow in big colonies. They have the whitish bark. They often have these very characteristic black uh, markings on the, on the stems. They're again, very important habitat for your rough grouse. They're hanging out in aspens and willows. Snowshoe hares, they're gonna nibble on them. And aspens are sort of interesting because they're unusual in that below the bark, you can almost see this sort of greenish look to them. Um, they can have a greenish tinge because there's a layer of photosynthetic material underneath the bark. Also notice on these plants is they got a pretty straight, clean trunk to them. And a lot of the growth is up here. And we're gonna take a different note that in, in a moment. But again, the bark is white to greenish, particularly in the springtime. And they think that that extra ability to photosynthesize even a little bit in the wintertime may just help provide enough extra starches and whatever to keep cells alive in that long dormant season. Compare the shape of that aspen that we were just looking at, that aspen to the shape of the cottonwood tree, much taller and very often they're really shaggy at the bottom. The bark is also extremely different. It's a, it's a deeply fissured, as they would say, um, bark of cottonwoods. There's several cottonwoods here. I give you all that information because the buds are really hard to tell. If you just have little twigs, it's really hard to tell them apart. You want those other clues. You may get a sense of sort of a reddish haze to this plant, a reddish um, feel to it. This is our black hawthorn, small tree, very sturdy shrub. This is what the bears love um, in the spring, in the fall time to come get those good big berries in them. They can, uh, these are sturdy plants. Little bears can be sitting up in there um, and they'll be held up in those branches. So black hawthorn, reddish bark, that helps. Look at those buds, look at them more closely, well-rounded, which is in complete contrast to the fact that they have these big long thorns to them. And again, just if you're lucky, you see a, a few extra fruits on them. So hawthorn is pretty easy to tell. Roses are also pretty easy to tell because you're gonna get these plants with all these prickles. I've got two different kinds of roses. It doesn't really matter if you know which is which, but we'll just talk briefly about them. One is called the Nuka rose. And it usually has bigger flowers and then a bigger rose hip to it. Okay, and they're usually born singly. And a rose hip is basically so the base of the flower, <clears throat> little flowers inside or little sacs inside, and they each make seeds. So these can be very nutritious. Seeds are very nutritious compared to the wood that most of the animals are trying to eat at this time of the year. So inside you have the hypanthium and then you have the seeds. And the nuka rose tends to have single flowers, whereas the woods roads, rose double O's, um, they tend to have flowers and then also fruits in clusters like this, like a woods, a forest has many trees in it, okay? And again, this is essentially a hypanthium or a hip with seeds inside. And they, if they hang on, they're terrific food late in the winter. It's hard to get you excited about this plant, I know. This is what it looks like in the snow. I try to get a good picture of it. It's pretty darn hard. 
But sometimes you'll see this little fuzzy stem coming up, and these sort of just nondescript, sort of funny looking buds. You may get some old fruits hanging out there. Well, this is complete contrast to what it looks like in the summertime. It's beautiful in the summertime. It has these great big leaves that then, again, sh shrivel up at this time of the year. You're lucky to get this much of a leaf. They have beautiful flowers, you know, luscious looking fruit. But then over the course of the winter, it fades. Not very appealing at this time of the year for pretty much anything unless you're browsing the stems. That's the thimble berry related to our edible raspberry. There's another set of mix of shrubs. These are all in the same family, by the way. They're all in the rose family. Other mix of shrubs that you see down the Moose Wilson Road, one of the reasons why we have all the bears down there is they produce a lot of fruits. This is the Moose Wilson Road at this time of the year, all twiggy. But if we look closely, we can tell what these are. There's two lookalikes out there, which it took me a, a while to discern to figure them out. So this one is a shape. It's been browsed. It can be almost tree-like, but uh, doesn't look very exciting at this stage. They're the two service berry and the choke cherry. Very similar. The twigs, which you look at at this time of the year, uh, they've got several different scales. They're both pointed. The service berry sometimes has a little bit more hair on it. Okay. It has a both of them have lenticels, but this one has a narrow leaf scar and the choke cherry, and notice I put the O there because they have a roundish leaf scar. This is the best way I've found for telling them about, apart. The color, the lenticels, the size, is, uh, they can blend in too, too easily, overlap too easily. So look for the difference there. Again, um, this looks a little bit simpler to identify the differences, but again, look at that leaf scar and that will make sure you've got the right thing. Other clues, and I just put these in because yeah, sometimes it's sort of fun to be a detective. Um, so let's look at the service area. This is in the late fall. This would be in the summer. Notice how each of these lovely fruits, where there was a flower, have different length pedicels to them and it dangles down. Notice that the ends here curl back. Again, different lengths, fairly long lengths of the pedicels. There's the fruit in a more um, shriveled form. And this is what happens when there's no fruits left. This is often what all what you have to go on besides those, those buds. Look at the choke cherry hanging down. Here you have um, little stalks to each of the fruits, and they're pretty much the same length going down. Again, it's so fascinating to watch these plants change over the season. And just to compare the difference here, this is the service berry here with a much longer type of stalks, pedicels to their fruits. You may get a few fruits, again, that little curl back at the tip. This one over here, is the choke cherry. As you can see a little stub of a pedicel. You can see maybe a fruit, but it doesn't have a little curl back at the tip. Again, this is a little bit more similar to those little short pedicels that are similar. And then if you have a cherry, if you look up at it, you may just see that you've got these long old pedicels or seams sticking out compared to this. So again, it gets you looking. Hopefully it helps you identify. Mountain ash is another member of the rose family. It also has these alternate buds, um, different kinds of leaves, much more compound, but we're talking about winter now. But notice they have these big bunches of fruits. Again, um, late summer, getting into the fall, all hanging there. These are absolute favorites of bears. This is not, while well, this is a lovely plant to think about for your backyard, maybe not as the bears are coming in. So uh, the fruits are highly um, appealing to bears and coyotes and birds and everybody else. 
And then you get down to the bud stage at this time of the year. And they have sort of, a, they're interesting. The, lot, the buds are large, they're quite sticky. And it's often hard to tell where the bud scales are. They also have these nice big lenticels and a fairly thick stem to them. Those are mountain ashes. They're also heavily browsed. And so this is what you may see and said, look at all that hair <laughs> from the moose that have come through browsing browsing these down at Trail Creek. Now we get into the opposite buds. These are right across from each other. There's several plants that have this um, arrangement of buds. And it's one of the easiest things to look at first. Okay, are they alternate or the opposite? These are opposite. Um, they have several bud scales and they have the, um, again, the, the bud scars. Look what comes out of the bud. Look at that. Out of that comes this. Amazing. All of that comes out of a bud. It's all those stem cells that begin to stretch and then get fed and more start dividing. And you get a whole new shoot, sometimes with a flower, um, coming out of a single bud. Amazing. Then you have your fruit. Look at the structure of that fruit and see what you have there. Again, opposite arrangements to things. And then we're back down to the bud stage again for the winter. It's just fun to think about the changes that are going on in the plants over this time. Twinberry um, often also gives the indication that things are opposite, they're twins. This is up at a little bit of a spring area at an old ranch in the park. They usually are into low areas along old streams where it's some moisture. Again, opposite buds, but look how different they are from the, um, from the ones we've been seeing. Very sort of sharp. Uh, but then you can see the dangles of the opposite fruits. What does that look like earlier in the season? This is the summertime with the two berries, the twin berries forming. And you can see how they're arranged and you can see how these are arranged opposite. Twin berry come from twin flowers. They're in the honeysuckle family. And then the twin fruits, really beautiful. Oh, but look at that. Well, not much at this time of year. Another disenchantment. Red stem dogwood. Remember, this is one of the plants that can take some of the coldest temperatures depending on where it's from. These have adapted over time in their own regions to really, really cold temperatures. They are at the bright red stems, as we can see here. They are heavily munched by the moose. And matter of fact, sometimes they're called moose ice cream because they're so um, desired by moose. So if they have them in your backyard, don't worry about them getting too big. Notice they have very slender buds, again, opposite and a very slender uh, leaf scar there. And that's important because you can compare it to our maple, which has much fatter buds and a fatter leaf scar. Of course, the fruits are very different. These are going to, um, dogwoods are going to produce white berries, whereas the maple have some arrows of these dried fruits that flutter away like little mini helicopters. So dogwood versus maple. At first, could if you just looked at the stalks, it may look similar, but look closely again as part of what winter botany is all about, is looking closely. Just a couple of more. Buffalo berry um, is scattered. Notice there's no critters that have been around here. It hasn't been munched. This is so fascinating. The buffalo berry was not eaten where other plants were being eaten all around this area along the Grovant River in the, in the bottomlands. They have an interesting set of buds. They have the terminal bud, which looks like two leaves, and then you have these little round side buds. What's the difference? Well, the terminal buds have the two leaves forming, and then the round buds are the flowers forming. Flower buds, very different in shape. You can go back again. The flower buds, they're just the shoot leaf buds. Notice they also have this sort of rough scaly structure to them, scurfy or lepidote scales as they call them. And there you see it again. 
That's typical of the Eleagnus family. Um, silverberry, which you also find in the bottom lands, usually a taller plant, um, has alternate buds here. But see all that scurfiness to it? That helps you know it's in the Eleagnus family. And then they have these fruits dangling down. Although again, many of those will um, drop off. They're sort of mealy and green inside. I see these under the cottonwood, cottonwood groves down off of Fall Creek Road. Just a final couple here. Sagebrush, I think we're all very familiar with that. The wonderful fragrance it has, the wonderful um, evergreen. These are evergreen leaves, by the way. Um, small, so they're not losing a lot of water. They have a lot of um, terpenes in them to keep them from being eaten by too many things because it's pretty hazardous to be out there in the wintertime um, having any nutrition to you because people are going to want the animals are going to want to eat it. But these are really tough plants, as most of you know. I mean, they are living there under the snow, these bushes, shrubs. And they're really important, as we also remember, for sage grouse because they snuggle in underneath, burrow in under the old stalks, and then they can sit there and then they can also um, nibble off the, the tips of those branches and digest those leaves. Mule deer also count on the sage, sagebrush throughout the wintertime. 25% of the, their diet is sagebrush. And one of the reasons they can eat all that sagebrush is because they have special uh, process in their stomach and they can literally burp out the gases that they um, that are created in eating those sort of um, highly chemically bound leaves of the sagebrush. One shrub I just found sort of everywhere and I just call it the twiggy shrub. It's the snowberry and it just is twiggy. It's, there's opposite little branches. It just looks twiggy. And they've got teeny tiny buds, which this is a hard picture to take because they were so small. Um, in the fall time, they're gonna have the snow berries. And then those are gonna get really turned into pretty much mush by this time of the year. So not very glorious. But again, this is a common shrub you're gonna see from sagebrush up into the forest openings. Now, just to finish up a little bit of fun time, we haven't talked about any of those herbaceous plants, the ones that technically die down to the ground, store all the extra food under the ground too. So I'm just gonna take you through this quiz, see if you can get some hints and think about what this is. And there it is, that's the musk thistle. And these are the seeds that are gonna fly out. And actually you're gonna have your goldfinches that are gonna come and uh, pull those out and, and sort of help this disperse, which is why it's such a weedy non-native plant. How about this one? Lots of little tiny seeds in there. Pretty, but you know, it's still standing strong in middle of January, the snow all around, goldenrod. Another one, one of my favorites, stalwart in the late summer, late summer bloomer. Any ideas? A little bit more hints. These are each individual flowers, had individual seeds to them. Cone flower. Each of these are little tiny flowers that each makes an individual seed. It's in full bloom right now. And you can see the, the bee doing its work in pollination. Very important because once it gets all those seeds, then you're going to have your pine siskins and other birds coming in for them. And this is the one that I think is the most remarkable. It's so delicate looking, it's still standing up, despite all the wind and all the snow. Late fall, shedding its seeds upon the wind. Any idea? Fireweed. So that's just a bit of sort of a full panoply of what you might see out there if you're out exploring, botanizing, just enjoying the world in the winter time. And just to give you a sense of what we've been talking about, 
No, it really is amazing to think about the remarkable set of skills they have. How do they survive? You know, they, they still don't know how it does it all, but it does. The conifers are much better adapted trees to very cold places than are deciduous trees for many reasons. The deciduous shrubs, the perennials, the annuals also have their methods of survival. None of them necessarily better or worse. It's just a different way of doing their, doing their survival. Our wildlife that sticks around in the wintertime really depends on these plants. And a botany is a puzzle, uh, especially at this time of the year. And I just find it so sort of intriguing um, to go after these clues and see if you can put the pieces together and know what it is. And with knowing more about what the name is, then you can find out so much more about um, how it works and how it's important. And then winter botany, if you've been looking at things this closely in wintertime, summer botany is going to be a heck of a lot easier. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your joining me tonight. And keep in mind our website, tetonplants.org. And we often will have our programs listed and other postings about how to identify plants there as well. And again, thank you for, to the Teton County Library for hosting this program every Tuesday, fourth Tuesday of the month, along with other nature nights. Again, thank you, and away we go.